Hello. Uh, so yeah, welcome to Corona Questions. That's what I've been calling it in my head for the last week anyway. Um, Richard, you want to pray for us as we start and then we'll explain what's going to happen? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Dan. Um, Father God, we just ask for you to meet with us during this time. Um, we thank you, Lord, that we can come to you with all our questions. Lord, I guess we, we do want to acknowledge, Lord, that you don't promise to answer every one of our questions. But, Lord, you do want us to be people who know enough about you to know that we can trust you, to know that you love us, to know that we can draw near to you whatever is going on in our world and in our lives. And, Lord, I pray that the result of tonight would be an increased love for you and an increased, actually, love for each other as well as we seek to um, explore these questions together. Lord, we're living in very strange times, um, times that can threaten to even overwhelm us. But Lord, please, would you, um, through this time, assure us that you are trustworthy and that you are with us in everything that's going on. Um, thank you for the opportunity of getting together like this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, so Richard, you were saying to me before this, normally when we do question and answer sessions, uh, we have like five, ten minutes after a sermon. So we've set aside an hour for it. It may not last an hour. We will see how we go. Um, and normally be on the back of a sermon. So Richard, you, you, uh, your YouTube sermons at the weekend were about a Christian response to coronavirus. Maybe it'd be helpful just recapping them in very brief, um, if you're able to. Yeah, yeah, Dan, thanks. And um, yeah, so I guess the, the focus, we kind of divided it into three sections. So what does COVID-19 teach us about ourselves? Um, and I guess in some ways that was just a lot about our own vulnerability. And um, I guess the feelings we're, we're generally feeling at the minute, but also that what the Bible says about it is true. We live in a fallen world. We're fallen people. Then we thought, what, the, what, does, the, what does COVID-19 tell us about God? We thought about the question of, is, is God judging us through um, COVID-19? We thought about the, the picture the Psalms give us of God being steadfast and strong in, in difficult and painful situations that are beyond our control. And we thought particularly about Jesus and the way he responds to suffering, to death, to, to disasters. And I guess those two responses we looked at, Luke 13, he actually says that all those things are like a wake up call to us. He tells people repent or perish is the message really when we hear of people losing their lives suddenly. Um, and then the other answer really was looking at that passage in John 11, where Jesus meets with Lazarus's sisters, Martha and Mary, and he just demonstrates his compassion for them while also demonstrating his power to, yeah, to overcome death ultimately. And then the last section what was basically how do we respond to COVID-19 and we thought about things that like we want to heed advice as part of our love for people we want to take our questions and our fears to God and we want to love one another well and we want to remember eternity trying to remember what those headings were and um, but yeah so that was the general gist of where we went there so trying to cover a fair bit of ground in quite a short space and that's why we thought as we would if we were meeting at the school on a Sunday, it would be helpful to have a chance for people to ask questions, make their own comments, reflections off the back of that. And then, so thinking about that, was there anything that you'd read or in your studies and thinking about it, was, was there any stuff that you thought, oh, I really wish I could squeeze this in, this would be really helpful, but time and flow of the sermon that you thought not helpful to get in on Sunday? Is there any stuff you wish you'd said? Yeah, I mean, I guess there's always things you, you, you feel like that. Um, I think probably one of the big things was just some of the reading I did really struck me that we've been here before as a world. Um, so certainly COVID-19 is not the first pandemic um, that has happened in our world. Um, and, you know, if Jesus doesn't come back, it won't be the last probably. Um, so in that sense, I guess that it does feel unprecedented. In many ways, it is unprecedented the time we're going through. But also that perspective that that. Um, humanity's been here before and more importantly i think christians and the church has been here before so some of the stuff i've been reading about just the way early christians responded to epidemics in the roman empire really demonstrating their love for people and the way they cared for people sort of setting up what we would now call as hospitals for instance and thinking about the way that you throughout history and the church has often been there think about the cholera outbreaks in victorian london and the likes of spurgeon responding to that think about the plague hitting germany and martin luther and urging Christians to, to help. Um, so yes, yeah, so once to get some of that historical perspective, I find really helpful and stimulating as I read that. Actually, we're hoping um, in a few weeks maybe to put another um, video on the YouTube channel, hopefully with our very own John Coffey, and thinking through some of that. Um, you know, John won't thank me if I tell him it's going to be uh, the authoritative word on, on Christians, pandemics, and history. But I think you know, he's done some thinking about this as well. 
of just lessons we can learn from previous generations. So that would have been some stuff would have been helpful to have it just there wasn't time. But it's exciting to see how God has somebody's really used difficult times like the one we're going through to demonstrate his character through the way his people love and serve those in need. So that was exciting and didn't didn't make it into the talks. I've got to look forward to seeing that video. Um, so we've got a few questions sent in in advance, got a few coming in through chat and WhatsApp. If you have any more um, questions during this, anybody who's watching this live, um, use a chat function or WhatsApp them to me. I'll try and get them. Um, yeah, so that'd be really good. So the few questions we've got to start in. First one came in today. Um, someone said, thinking about Hebrews 12, verse 11, which says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So the question this person had was, what do you think God is teaching us at Avenue during this lockdown? So it's clearly a time of discipline, um, not just for the world at a global level, but for us individually and as Christians and as a church. Um, what do you think God is teaching us? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um... I mean, yeah, Hebrews 12 is an amazing passage to come to in times like this. Uh, anytime you're Christian life, and I think it's to introduce the answer really is kind of that the writer of Hebrews makes that big statement about discipline rather than punishment. And I think that's something quite important. So he's writing to Christians, and that, that's important to remember that. But we often think when bad things are happening to us, and I guess the, if you know the book of Hebrews, we looked at a couple of years ago as a church, bad things were happening to these Christians. They were struggling. And you might be thinking, well, is God punishing us for things we've done wrong? And instead, the writer of Hebrews says, no, God is disciplining you as he, as a good father disciplines his children. And he's got this great stuff about basically, you know, discipline is a sign of love. Discipline is a sign that actually your father loves you and cares enough about you. Um, so in that sense, it's funny that why we looked a bit about in the video is about like, is God punishing us through COVID-19? I think for a Christian, there's a sense where God, we, I think there's a right sense where the Bible says that, we can never say God is punishing me. God is disciplining me. He does that in many different ways, but he does that because he's a father who loves us and he's not a vengeful God out to get us because actually our punishment has been taken by Jesus on the cross. So that distinction of discipline rather than punishment, I think is a helpful one. And the question, what is the Lord maybe teaching us at the minute? It's not pleasant at the time later, it produces a harvest of righteousness. I mean, that's, that's a really difficult question to answer. Um, you know, I don't have the authoritative answer on that. Just been thinking, obviously, the last few weeks about what the Lord might be doing through this. Um, in some ways, we are being forced to slow down. Um, some of us, maybe particularly the first few weeks, maybe quite liked that. I would imagine we're all hitting a bit of a season now going, well, without knowing when the end's in sight, it's becoming more difficult that. But there is a sense that a lot of things we're used to doing, we're having to stop. And I'm, th I'm thinking, I'm thinking about us corporately as a church as well as individually. And I think there's always a danger with a church like, like ours that is committed to getting the gospel out. And more than that, you know, I'm going to flatter people's faces I can't see, but we're full of gifted people. Um, yes, I mean that. But no, I think we are. And there's people, we're, we're good at putting on events. We're good at organizing things. You, you, we're not perfect, but we work pretty good at it. And I think as a result, we can become activists. It's all about what we do. And we've said several times about Christmas events, for instance, we know, humanly speaking, we can put on a good Christmas event. We can get good musicians. We can get good lighting. We can you know, put on a good show. But actually, it's only if we're asking God to work by his Holy Spirit, will any life be changed as a result of that? And we can't just rely on our skills and our giftedness. And I wonder if one of the things the Lord might be teaching us is just a fresh sense of we really need to rely on him and not on ourselves. So I think if we were still meeting every week at Avenue School, if we were still able to put on our, our youth groups, our, our kids clubs, our evangelistic events, there's always that danger that we could say, yeah, we, we can do this. We, we've done this before. or We've got good ideas. We can make this happen, run it successfully. And I think it's one of these things where God is just saying, actually, just we, no, we can't do any of those things. And it's a very humbling thing. It's a very strange thing. I'm finding it difficult. There's a bit of even, dare I say, bereavement about that, you know, a bit of grief over not being able to do what I'd love us to be doing. But, but maybe that's God saying, actually, it's not about your activity and it's not about all you bring. I think there's a sense where the Martha and Mary story, not the John 11 one, but the one in Luke's gospel, where Martha's rushing around, getting everything ready for this great meal for Jesus. And Mary is just sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him. And Martha gets really irritated at Mary. And I think 
And when I read that story, I get irritated at Mary. I kind of think, yeah, there's work to be done. But actually, maybe there's a sense where we are naturally Marthas. We're naturally activists. And some of what might be the Lord might be teaching us now is to realize only one thing is necessary, and that's sitting at Jesus' feet, learning from him. Now, that obviously, some of us are massively active at the minute as well. It's not that everyone's sitting in blissful um, seclusion. Some of us are, are working really hard and finding that a real strain. But I guess in some ways, we are all of us, I think, being forced, I hope we're being forced, actually, to pray more, to recognize our limitations, and to say, Lord, we need you to be at work in this situation. We need you to be working our lives. Please help us. And if Christians are in a position where we're saying, please help us, I think that's a healthy place for us to be. Mm. So that's one. I mean, again, there's loads. I think there's, you know, you could talk about family relationships. You could talk about having to, to slow down if you're in families, if you've if you're in a marriage or if you're with kids and you're forced to live together, we're maybe being forced to learn again what it means to love one another, bear with each other, forgive each other. Um, if, we're, if we're living on our own, actually, there's a sense of right. I can't rely on other people around me at the minute. So Lord, please, would you really demonstrate your faithfulness in this? So because our, all our situations are different, the lessons will be different. Mm-hmm. But, um, but I think trusting that God is, I think the writer of Hebrews is amazing. He just says it's not painful at the time. It's not pleasant at the time, it's painful. And I love that because we sometimes think as Christians, we need to just be smiling and singing the whole time. But he's really confident there's a harvest of righteousness as a result. And reading Hebrews 12 at the minute is great for us to go, actually, God isn't going to waste this time. He's going to bring good out of it. And some days we'll say that with confidence and other days we'll say that with a bit of a shaky voice. But but it's true both days. Yeah. Great, thank you. I think that's really helpful. I think that ties in with... Um... The next question as well. So someone else sent in um, <clears throat> Psalm 46 verse 8 says, come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. And so the question from that was, can we say that God has brought this co- uh, coronavirus to bring us Christians or not to exalt him? Um, and then as Christians, are we any more protected knowing him and praying for peace, healing for ourselves and for our loved ones so it's kind of two parts to that question um can we say that god has brought this to make us exalt him more um and are we as christians any safer i guess is a better way of summarizing that yeah no it's a great question there um i mean psalm 46 is a very precious psalm actually again we i think we sent that out in an email the very first week that sort of lockdown was on the way and i know a number of people including myself who just find that psalm really helpful god is our refuge and our strength and ever present help in trouble Again, I think the portrayal of God we get in that psalm is a, is a re- wonderfully comforting one. And one big thing the psalmist does there is he's contrasting the nations. He's contrasting human power with God's power. And he's showing that actually God is far greater than any human power. And I guess in that sense that God is humbling the nations, will humble the nations, says Psalm 46. That's a refrain all the way through scripture. So God is sovereign. And God is greater and more powerful than any human authority. And again, like we said in that first video, what does COVID-19 tell us about ourselves? It tells us we're a lot more vulnerable than we think we are. And we're in a lot less control than we like to think we have. So there's, there's challenge there. I think there is a sense where you can say in very broad terms, God regularly does humble us, humble us, whether we're individuals, whether, and in this situation, whether even entire nations, entire economies, you can say we are being humbled. I think where we need to tread carefully is saying that God is having this you gleeful little experiment and playing a trick on us or just trying to mess around with our lives, with life and death. We know from scripture that's not who God is. God is good. He is steadfast. He is loving. He doesn't delight in the death of anyone. He doesn't delight in the death of the wicked. Um, so in that sense, it's not that God is rubbing his hands going, great, I'm just going to mess everyone's lives up. But there is a sense, I think, we're in his goodness. He is wanting to humble us. And I guess some of the challenge in all this is how are we going to respond? It's like any moment of suffering or challenge for us. Either we respond by drawing near to God or we respond by turning our back on him. And in Psalm 46, there are both responses. There is the response of God's people. He's our refuge and strength. We're going to get closer to him. And there's the response of the nations where God ultimately has to say, be still and know that I am God. So I think, is God, has God brought COVID-19 to exalt himself and show his glory? And I think ultimately there's a sense where at the end of history, we're, we are all going to be 
exalting God and saying, Him and glorious, whether we admitted it here or here and I or not. Every knee will bow and confess that Jesus is Lord. We should be praying, actually, that God will be exalting himself to the point where lots of people do humble themselves before him. And that's, that's really important, I think, that we pray for that. That's not automatic. And um, again, sometimes we can say, oh, suffering will always mean, I mean, we use that quote, C.S. Lewis, a brilliant quote, whose suffering is God's megaphone to, to rise a deaf world. I, I think that's really true and insightful, but obviously we also know that suffering can make our hearts even harder towards God. So I think it's right for us to be praying that the effect of a lot of the, the COVID-19, the effects of it on all of us would actually lead to lots of people asking big questions about themselves, asking big questions about God. And that is the, that is the outcome we want to see. And that's the outcome we should be praying to God for. But again, in the mystery of the sovereignty, um, there are people who will respond to this by hardening their heart against God. Maybe people who will be crying out to God right now and then should restrictions be lifted in however long, they will go back to life as it always was. So, um, so that's part of the heartbreak, but that's why, again, we've got a part to play in praying for, for the people around us. So I think COVID-19 hasn't taken God by surprise. Um, God works through all things. Um, he is sovereign, and that's really good news. That doesn't mean he delights in causing distress, pain, death. He doesn't, and the Bible's very clear on that. Um, and I think the other question about, was that about were our Christians more protected? Or what was that second part? Yeah, are we as Christians any more protected through knowing him and praying for peace, healing for ourselves and our loved ones? Do we have, yeah, are we any more protected is what it says. Yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I think eternally, yes, <laughs> we've got out again. I was really struck by that the last few weeks thinking about eternity. Like, like I said in that talk, if you heard it, I, I regularly find myself saying to people, oh, you know, the gospel's not just about life after death, but so much more. And I do stand by that, by the way. Um, but it is also about life after death. And I think some of this, it kind of focuses our minds. It kind of goes, we are going to die one day. And Christians, like anyone else, particularly in the West, we can maybe just imagine we're going to live forever. So there is something very humbling about that. Are we more protected? Yes, if we are trusting in Jesus, we're protected eternally. And so we may well die of COVID-19. Um, but we have, we have eternal security in Christ. And that is wonderful news. But are we more protected? No, Christians are flesh and blood. We are fallen human beings like everyone else, and we all can catch COVID-19. If, if we thought scripturally we weren't at any risk, we'd still be meeting together as a church. <laughs> we'd still, there obviously are horrible stories of slightly wacky churches offering to heal everyone of COVID-19 um, with special potions and things. We're, we don't think that's what scripture teaches. So we are just as vulnerable to COVID-19 as a Christian, as, as, as an unbeliever. And also, I think praying for healing. I mean, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? You know, I think Jesus pretty clearly says the Lord makes the sun shine on the righteous and the unrighteous. So it's right to pray. If you have friends, family, colleagues who have got COVID-19 and aren't believers, pray for them. And praise God, he often answers those prayers and, and, and brings healing um, through, through medicine or through miraculous ways. Um, so in that sense, you, oh, they're not a Christian, I shouldn't pray. Or they are a Christian, I will pray, knowing God will heal. I think neither of those is true. We, we pray for anyone. We pray for an unbeliever to be better and then want to know Jesus as a result. We pray for Christians to, to stay around because we love them and we trust that God might have more work for them to do. But equally, um, we entrust them into God's hands and go, if, it's, if, if you want to take them home to be with you, Lord, we, we trust you for that and we grieve, but we grieve with hope. Um, so yeah, so there's certainly not a, a particular level of protection we have physically. Eternally, we are safe. And again, that is a massive part of the gospel that, as I say, in some times I would probably reflect on my own practice. I probably not emphasize that as much as I could because, of, oh, well, no one really thinks about death, do they? And I think now a lot of us are thinking about death and that brings the gospel into sharper focus. I think, I think it's very apt that we, uh, we studied Ecclesiastes before with this, this all happened um, with all its brevity of life. And um, I think tying in with some of that, um, we also another question saying, so do you think then, I think you've sort of touched on this, but do you think that God does do specific judgments for specific sins now? So like Ananias and Sapphira. Um, yeah. Do you think those things are things we should be wondering about and thinking about now? I guess a lot of people have said around the world that this is a specific judgment by God against certain sins. Should we be thinking that way? Yeah. I mean, it's a, I think it's a challenging one. I think the, the short answer is yes, I do believe God does judge for specific sins. 
but it's very difficult to identify that. Um, so what I, I say yes, because part of the example in the question, Ananias and Sapphira, in the book of Acts, you know, there is a sense where, where God does very immediately judge them for their dishonesty and their greed. Um, we've got um, 1 Corinthians 11 talks about, um, 1 Corinthians 11 is at verse 30, talking about the way the Christians in Corinth are abusing the Lord's Supper. And Paul says, it's a really serious thing what you're doing. And he goes, that is why many among you are weak and ill and a number of you have fallen asleep. So again, the apostle Paul would say, actually something God does judge specifically for specific sins. And I think a lot of Christians throughout history have taken those passages to go, I mean, it's interesting. Again, it's, again, it's not a way I normally think, maybe many of us think, but actually if someone is, is feeling even unwell, some of the Purans would have said, actually, the first thing you do is you pray and you go, Lord, show me if this is as a result of unrepentant sin. And again, it's, it feels so alien to think in those terms, but there is scriptural backing for that. So the sense of going, well, is the Lord trying to use this illness to, to teach me something about ways that I've not been loving him, not been loving my neighbor? I think that the challenge with all that is that we don't have, we, it's very difficult to be 100% clear on that. And again, you've got other passages in scripture, say John 9, um, with the man born blind. And the disciples go, oh, did he, is he blind because he sinned or because his parents sinned? And Jesus said, well, no, neither. This is going to happen to glorify God. So we can't make a really, really firm line between someone sin and what's happening to them. And again, you mentioned Ecclesiastes, Dan, the year before that we did Job. And again, that's a wonderful example, a powerful example of actually this suffering man going through so much pain and his friends are absolutely convinced it's because he sinned and that's not the case at the end of the book you know well we, we know that from the beginning of the book but also at the end of the book <clears throat> god is very clear this wasn't because job had sinned that he was suffering so does god sometimes bring specific judgment for a specific sin i think scripture's answer would be yes but we need to be very careful of i think i think the application of that is going if you yourself are, think, are asking questions about things that are happening to you, I think you're going back to the sense of, of the discipline category of Hebrews 12. What is the Lord trying to teach me in this? It may be partly just you're a fallen human being in a fallen world, in which case the lesson of that is just keep trusting in God and keep trusting in Jesus. If there are things you need to repent of, you repent of them, but it's not an automatic, I repent of this great and I'm healthy. You know, again, we, we, don't, we have to trust God in all of that. But there certainly are categories for linking judgment to specific sin but we need to be very careful of making those connections too clearly. And my general rule would be never make that connection for someone else. I think that's something that in your own relationship with the Lord, you say, okay, I kind of know things have been out of whack for a while and suddenly I've got this health issue. Lord, maybe I just need to take this opportunity. We're maybe back to the Luke 13 stuff, you know, unless you repent, you too will perish. And sometimes we get these wake up calls that tell us, actually, I need to get right with God. I need to stop messing around with him. Um, but I think to say that for someone else, I think is very dangerous ground. And Job's friends are, I think, a warning sign to us in that. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, I think as well that um, thinking about that question with coronavirus in general, it'd be very hard to say that coronavirus itself is a judgment from God because A, we've got no clear leading that God is has said he's judging a particular thing. And B, this is global. This isn't just to a certain people group. This is everybody around the world so yeah it being a judgment for specific sins would be quite hard to rationalize with with scripture really um we've had a few other questions that come on in so um firstly um should we call out unhelpful or even sinful behavior in our brothers and sisters in the way they respond to coronavirus and the lockdown um or should we be sensitive to the strange and upsetting times that we're in how do we then call out sin without being hypocritical? I guess it's very possible to, yeah, to be having a sinful response of one form, calling out another sin. Yeah, if we see people responding to this sinfully, how do we respond? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think we always need to be compassionate in the ways we call out sin, whatever's happening, actually. I mean, Jesus is really clear. We've got logs in our own eyes always, and we can see, we, we're, we're very clear as what other people's problems are. <laughs> um, other people's problems are easy. You just go, well, you just need to do this and sort it out. It's our own problems that are really difficult and no one can talk to us on. So, so I, think, I think there's a blanket statement, I think, in the Sermon on the Mount. Do not judge. 
Um, that doesn't mean don't lovingly help each other to love Jesus and to repent of sin, but always be aware there's a plank in your own eye. Um, so we have to do that with real um, caution and I think compassion, because again, you just, you know, a heartbeat later, they are rightly going to be able to say to you the things that you need to sort out. And we need to have that understanding that actually never am I as a sinless person challenging someone else for their sin. So we need to be compassionate. And I think particularly at this time, um, you know, for someone to go, oh, cheer up <laughs> or don't be so nervous, you know, it might not happen. And um, those aren't scriptural um, words of comfort at all. Um, what, what you do do is go, let's, let me pray for you now. Let's remember that God is with us. Let's look at a psalm together, those sort of things. And I think if we are worried about how people are responding to COVID-19, I guess that's many, any, any number of ways. If we see people resorting to really escapism to get them through it, so I don't know if they're, they're drinking too much or they're eating too much or you know, they're neglecting you know, loved ones or, or things like that, you know, I think we can gently say, I'm, just, I'm, I'm feeling a bit worried about you. Are you doing okay? Um, and, you know, absolutely just have those conversations lovingly, but don't blare in going, I, I see what your problem is and I'm going to tell you how to sort it out, you, you weakling. Because we are all weak and we're all sinful. And I think it is that statement, we need to speak the truth in love. And it's even that phrase I've said many times is abused. You in love, you're a bit rubbish. That's not what speaking the truth in love is. Speaking the truth in love is, is love. love is patient. Love is kind. Actually, in the, the patient side of love is really key, that we can grow impatient with each other when we're going through difficult times. And actually, sometimes our own anxieties are exacerbated maybe by seeing someone else being very anxious. And then we angrily want them to stop being anxious or stop us being anxious. I don't know if that makes sense, but just yeah, the yeah. same. I don't need you dragging me down right now, so sort it out, is not speaking the truth in love. So I think, you know, be careful. I think, you know, pray about it. I think don't rush off half-cocked saying, I know what your sin is. Ask questions. We need to do that of each other. And open up about your own struggles. I think, you know, again, if amazingly with Jesus, we have a high priest able to sympathize with our weaknesses and a high priest familiar with suffering. And if one Christian says to another from a position of strength, as if I don't really struggle in this way, but I see you are, and I, I, let me tell you how to sort it out. That's just not like, that's not the way Jesus does it. And if we're doing it not the way Jesus does it, we're probably doing it wrong. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, I think we can lovingly challenge, but the emphasis on love, the emphasis on honesty, being honest about our own fears, our own vulnerability. Um, and again, check your motives. It's not just kind of like, I don't want you bringing me down. It's actually together. We need to bear each other up, carry each other's burdens, says Galatians. And that's, that's a key part of loving each other well during this time. I guess that's part of the posture as well, that we need to be willing to be challenged as well, even if somebody is possibly wrong in the way they challenge us or what they challenge us about. If we're unchallengeable, that isn't loving in response, is it? So I think both sides of that are helpful to think about. Um, got a couple of questions that are tied in. I'll read half of one, first of all, and then we'll uh, unmute somebody, which is exciting. Um, but the first bit is, what do you anticipate, and maybe you don't, but what do you anticipate some of the spiritual or church aftermath of COVID looking like? What are those things that are mulling around your head of, I wonder if this is going to be, what's next? That's a good question in route into my internal anxieties. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so as I say, the first, I probably said in the first sermon on YouTube, you know, that first week, I did not sleep very well at all. And woe is me, but there you go. I, I, I know lots of us are in that book. Um, it is, it is really unpredictable. We don't know. Um, is, is the brief answer. I guess it is those senses of, you know, we might have to change quite a lot of things we do. Um, certainly actually we were beginning to, to tighten up on things like hygiene, um, at the school. And we need we were need to think more about how we do food together on a Sunday. So again, these are you know very feel like very minor details, but actually there are things that we're probably going to have to think about. I think there's going to be a real ongoing need to keep reviewing as and when some restrictions are lifted. Um, and even I think even that wonderful picture that I've actually been helped by, which is just the first Sunday we gather together, let's just give each other big hugs. And, you know, whip around each other. And actually, a few <laughs> health professional friends have said, no, we won't be giving each other big hugs because we need to be right careful. So 
I think we need to be careful not to get so, I mean, the first Sunday we meet together, I am hugely looking forward to, but I'm also accepting that might be quite a long way off. And also I think we all need to accept that as and when that, that Sunday comes, things will look a bit different. I can't really predict fully what that will look like. And um, I've heard things about, say, I think it's Germany has, has lifted some restrictions on churches. It's fascinating things. I think I'm right in this, that, that it's still social distancing. They have to be, have the social distancing between each other. Everyone has to wear face masks and um, there's no singing, apparently. So this, I've just heard this say, I don't know if this is true, but again, that seems even that sense of we're all sing, singing God's praises together and will there suddenly be a sense where is that wise and helpful with us all breathing in and breathing out? I mean, that, the mind boggles at that, doesn't it? The sense of actually we would, if nothing else in Zoom sessions, we have to sing on our own, but we're still able to sing. So again, I think, in, I think broadly what it says is we just don't know, but I think we have to be prepared. There will be changes to how we do things. The primary thing is we are still called to love God and to love one another and to proclaim the gospel. Our mission is the same. Mm. And whether we do our mission more online at the minute, which is what we're doing, and um, whether we have to think really creatively about things like, I mean, again, you think about, you know, I don't know, I've not even thought of this before, but a carol service, we like to pack everyone in for a carol service at Christmas. Will this Christmas have to be different? We just don't know. Will we be able to have a carol service this Christmas? We just don't know. And I feel my face flushing. You know, these are things that make me anxious. Mm. But again, we go back to, we just need to trust in God in this and ask him to show us the way. And again, I think, I think, uh, I think it's Anne Wilma, I'll name and shame her, but she mentioned this in our home group a while ago, helpfully, of just, you know, every day genuinely has enough worries of its own. Jesus says that. So just go to God today, ask him to help you today, give us today your daily bread. And every day is enough of worries of its own. And I think there's a rightness to planning and be assured as elders, we're trying to do as much forward planning as we can. But equally, there's a sense where we really don't know what the future holds. And so actually, we just want to, Help me love you today, God. Help me to love the people around me today, God. Help me to, to pray today and to pray for your kingdom to come today. And then you go to sleep and then you wake up the next morning and you go, okay, Lord, it's another day. Help me to love you. Help me to love the people around, around me. So yeah, that's, I think it is the day at a time thing is maybe the most helpful, but yeah, it is going to be interesting and maybe challenging but also i think we've got to trust that there could be really good opportunities coming out of this there might be some ways we do things that have to change but there could be benefit from that we we just don't know right now but again we i take comfort from god doesn't waste things and even though there might be some things we will be sad not to be able to do for a while or even maybe even ever again we can still trust him um, even when we don't have the full um yeah answers that we'd like I think a lot of people um, have asked a lot of the, well, a lot of the questions you answered a fair bit in that bit, but some of the stuff coming out is have we, as an elders, have we thought about the practical future? So lockdown is lifted. Do we have any ideas, any thoughts on what next? Um, maybe meeting in another place or church, church building at another time. Um, have we got any idea? I guess people in our church family want to know what church might look like in the lighter lockdown weeks and months. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that the, the thing is we just need to keep asking those questions. And there's a sense where, as I say, go back to the thing, you know, we get through each day and that's important. And I think as elders a few weeks ago, we were really struck. We, I guess in one sense, we've been kind of in crisis mode, kind of adrenaline driven. You know, Let's just get certain things up and running. Let's get sermons and all the age slots done. Let's get, you know, brilliant worksheets out by dawn. Let's try and just get Bibles, you know, all those things. And that's been good and healthy. I think we, we were chatting as elders a while ago, just saying we just want to do as much as we can in, about the normal life of the church, even though it has to be um, online. And so that's what we're doing is at the family meeting on Tuesday. That's why we're, we're just trying to, we're going to, going to keep you preaching through bits of God's word. You know, we're not going to put everything through a COVID-19 filter. Um, but yeah, we are, we are thinking and praying and uh, really weighing up how things might look differently. And also there, there's things like all this was it that are beyond our control. So again, there's things like we don't know, we'll have a new primary school, for instance, but have a, have a new policy of not doing outside lets for the foreseeable future. Will Ralston primary school have the same thing? So once we suddenly will be in the position of going right, where do we meet? And do we need to, I mean, the challenge would be how to find a way of gathering together while, keeping social distancing you know that's a whole challenge in and of itself um and 
what that looks like is really interesting. Do you go? Do you suddenly go multi-service? There's a small number come at various points for the same service, but again, does that just dilute so much what we believe the Scripture teaches the church is? Um, so you'll hear from answer. We don't have any definitive answers right now because we genuinely don't know. There is just so much unknown at the minute. But we're certainly not. I think. There probably was a right sense at the beginning going, won't it be great? Let's just get through this. It'll hopefully be just, I don't know, a couple of months. We'll be back to normal. And wouldn't that be a relief? I think there's a sense of we're going to head into a new normal. People are using that phrase a lot. But I don't think anyone really knows what that new normal is, is going to be. So I'd really encourage all of us to pray for the elders and for all of us, actually, as a church family, to think about how we grapple with some of these questions. Um, you say, even if lockdown gets lifted, potentially Avenue Premises, says, please come in. We need the money from your let. Do we need to say actually no for the foreseeable future? You know, what do we do with home groups? Do we say there's some healthy people, some, some, some people who have got underlying health conditions? You know, do we have some home groups meeting physically, others doing online? We just don't know. Would that just be too divisive for a home group? So I'd say we've certainly got more questions than answers at the minute. So please pray for us. And um, please, for all of us, just pray that we would all be trusting God as we answer these questions, ask these questions. So it's not, it's not just that God will magically make the, the, the finished package land in our minds and our hearts. I don't think that's how God works, actually. But we do want, as we grapple with questions, and some of us get quite overwhelmed by them, we want all the time to be saying, but Lord, we can trust you. We can trust you in this. So, um, so yeah, please pray for others as we make these things. But yeah, be assured, we're, we want to love our church family well. And we don't want to cut corners and make people put people at risk for the sake of running a nice program. That is not what we're here for. We want to bring glory to God and bring glory to God means we, we love the people we've got and we love the wider world because that's what God tells us to do. And we want to do that as leaders. And I think it's fair to say as well, if people hear of things that churches are doing around the country that are successful and working and they've got ideas, send them over. We can't guarantee we'll do everything. We're not every other church we are avenue with the skills and gifts we've got but we want to be hearing what other churches are doing similarly we are we're trying to keep our ear to the ground as much as possible so we were on a zoom seminar early today with a 130 different church leaders from around the country just listening to what's going on trying to learn from them so yeah we are yeah we are trying to see what we can do learning what we can do trying to plan where we can and trying to react well where we can um yeah we've got a question as well that says that um it seems that people are more open to spiritual matters during this time with evidence that more people are going to the church in different forms. So what practical ways can we help those that we know who may be looking into Christianity at this time, particularly given the restrictions that there are on church meetings like this? Yeah. So again, you always love those photos we have and sharing the gospel. With your friends always has two very attractive people in a coffee shop with a Bible open. Um, some of us are attractive, but, but we, we can't always do that in coffee shops. So yeah, at the minute, yeah, those things have just, it's all, it's all so new, isn't it? So in one sense, we could say things like, if you, if you have a friend who's asking lots of questions about, about who Jesus is, you could absolutely do something like Christian explored with them um, on, a, on a video call, either Zoom, WhatsApp, whatever. And actually, myself, Dan, Jake, others have been doing that quite a lot, one-to-ones in that way. And and it can work okay. It's not the same. It's not as good. Um, but um, you've got to be careful at time lengths. So certainly the idea of just on screen is just more tiring. Um, so there's that. But actually, you can do a huge amount um, in that way. So you could just say, right, you know, let's look at Mark's gospel together. Um, let's look at who Jesus is in Mark's gospel. And either you could potentially on your daily exercise pop a Mark's gospel through the letterbox or post it to them. And then you say, when it arrives, right, we'll do it now amazingly i'm told you don't even need books for that until you can do stuff online you know i, I don't really believe in that look at my lovely books behind me and um, but yeah there's lots of ways you can do it and also there's obviously lots of online resources as well so again um i think i think for instance inside christian i explored i actually think i could be wrong in this there might be a lot of that available on youtube and um, equally you know as and when it's helpful you could even say actually at our church we did something on this or we had a sermon on this why not look at the youtube thing and then you could you chat about it afterwards. And obviously the pressure is on, on your friend <laughs> to watch it or to dodge it. Um, and, you know, we obviously don't absolutely hold them to, to having to do that. But you're just thinking creatively about, um, you know, how can we use the, use the questions people have at this time? I think in some ways in our YouTube stuff, we're, we're kind of, when we're preaching to camera, 
um, we do have kind of both Avenue Church family in mind, and that feels still really key. We want to be absolutely feeding one another from God's word. But also we're aware there are people outside of our church family who might be watching. And that feels an amazing opportunity. Again, there's always that question of how can we get someone through the doors of Avenue School? Um, and you know, historically, that's always been a challenge. But actually, if someone has a fair bit of time in their hands, as, as a lot of people do at the minute, um, actually clicking on a YouTube thing, they might well watch it. And, um, and we were praying that they do. So, so yeah, just, we're trying to think about that with, with, with our online content. Um, so, yeah, so I think there are ways you could point people even to Avenue resources. But, you know, we won't be offended if you point to other resources. But I think there are ways creatively we can do that. I think one thing we wouldn't, I think I would urge against, which I probably would have said the first few weeks was, oh, great. If someone asks a question, great. When all this is over, let's get together for a coffee. Or when all this is over, let's 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 come around for dinner and we'll chat about that. Actually, I think just time scales look very uncertain at the minute, and we don't want to waste this time. I think again, when more people potentially are going back to work, would say some of our furloughed friends are maybe off furlough and back to work. Suddenly, life is going to get very busy again, and suddenly, as we all know, those bigger questions will be pushed down to one side. So we want to make the most of opportunities now. So I think there are creative ways, but just make the most of it. I think a lot of people are getting used to Zoom, video chats, even phone calls. And I think there are ways that we can share the gospel with them. There's lots of good online resources out there. And equally, if we know of good things, let's share them with each other. Let's say, actually, here's a really good apologetics series of lectures, or here's a really good evangelistic resource that you could use. Um, and, and just make the most of those opportunities, even in lockdown, using, using online means. I think as well, I'm, I'm kind of ch- challenged and encouraged that this is an opportunity for people who, in the church who, for example, may often just go, oh, I'm a bit nervous about sharing the gospel. Come to church with us. This is maybe potentially shaking us out of their comfort zone where that's not an option. So it's almost down to us to share it ourselves, which will hopefully equip us and skill us longer term to share the gospel more with people in the future when we are allowed to see them face to face. But yeah, but, and also there's a sense where if we're nervous about it, again, and make the most of other voices. There's always that. It's always, it's basically the logic of having an evangelistic speaker, isn't it? Yeah. Bring your friend to see an evangelistic speaker. And if your friend doesn't like what the evangelistic speaker says about the gospel, you can say, yeah, I wouldn't have put it like that. <laughs> so you cover yourself, but actually isn't Jesus great or something. And so what you can do with online stuff is you can say, actually, you've got this question, watch this. And if they don't like everything, you can say, well, I didn't say it. That's okay. But also you can say, actually, but yeah, but actually that point, you said, that would, that, that's true, isn't it? And you're thinking, well, yeah, I suppose it is. And you can take it from there. And always we need to be praying alongside that. And, and I guess, again, even we said, Dan, I guess the sense of maybe somebody can say, well, I'll maybe bring someone to church and other Christians will, will step in and, and, and share the gospel with them. I guess there is a sense where, like a lot of things, we are just being forced back to God right now, going, I can't rely on other people ultimately. So I need to be praying for my friend. But let's pray for our friends. Let's not say... I think the danger could be we get so tired by just the restrictions currently that we maybe, I think we do take our eye off the ball in terms of sharing the gospel. And we don't want to do that. We want to say, actually, this is, as the questioner says, this is a time of lots of spiritual questioning to people. And let's, let's make the most of it uh, as best we can with the people we know and using, using whatever means we can. And it's fair to say as well. So I know of churches around the country that have run Christianity Explored through Zoom. And if that was something that would be helpful, to you or your friends let us know we'd love to do that we would love to put things like that on and be able to reach out we're thinking of how we can do that on as monsel in the weeks ahead as well so yeah those are things we want to be doing um yeah we, and we did try and run a chris thanks a few months ago and weren't able to just the, the few people who said they're going to drop out so so actually yeah that's if, if we do a like, zoom chris thanks that would be that'd be brilliant yeah please if you know people let us know yeah that's great Dan. Um, I think that is all of the questions that we've had so far, unless anybody desperately wants to type something into the chat box um, and I can unmute somebody um, or they can WhatsApp me. I think we've covered all the questions so far, um, which is great. You've answered everyone's questions. Not just 10 minutes. It's powerful. <laughs> um, I think this has been really helpful. It's been good to, to think about um, what God is doing. Again, it's another angle of thinking about what is what God is doing through coronavirus and the truth is we just don't know but our call as Christians is to trust him uh, and to respond whenever possible with sharing the gospel with whoever and however we can and the ways in which we can share the gospel is is limited at the moment Um, 
but in other ways it's expanded people have got more time people are more desperate for human interaction so people might be more open to chatting to us about these things and it's how we take those opportunities and how we um use them for the best um so let's hope and pray that this is a um this is a time where god is just preparing the the soil for the seed to be planted in or even that seed is being planted that's going to sprout and fruit uh, when all this lockdown is lifted great uh, there are no other questions dashing in so um do you want to pray for us Tom? i'd love to pray for us yeah i'll pray and then i will uh, stop recording and then we will release the videos so great let's pray <clears throat> father thank you that your ways are not our ways thank you that we don't understand what's going on and lord we confess and admit that we don't understand what's going on fully in the world right now um but yet we can trust you thank you that you show time and time again through your word just how trustworthy you are even when situations are baffling and confusing thank you that you showed that most of all at the cross with that travesty of justice where that wonderful man was killed as a criminal you were working it for the ultimate good to achieve the salvation of our souls and the forgiveness of our sins thank you that we can trust you thank you that we can ask questions that we're not forbidden from doing that thank you that we can um turn to you and bring these things to you i pray that you'd help us give us wisdom as to know how to uh, love one another well whether that means calling people out for sinful responses or whether that is bearing one another's burdens together i pray that you'd help us know how to make the most of these opportunities that we have to talk about eternity talk about death and talk about um the lack of fear that we have the other side of death thank you that um becoming a christian and being saved is not just something for after death but thank you that it is that as well and pray that you'd help us all to trust that and declare that and rejoice in that and father we long to be back together we long to be seeing each other and singing together and worshiping you and praising you and spurring each other on face to face we look forward to that day we pray that you would help us to keep going keep persevering until then amen amen thanks Tom. thank you very much richard